fruits and vegetables are facing an absurd situation. On one hand, people are encouraged to eat at least five a day. A lot of money for families. On the other, we throw 300 million tons of it away each year. Tout ce qui rentre pas dans la norme, eh ben c'est poubelle. As the European Union made 2014 the European Year Against Food Waste, Intermarché, the third largest supermarket chain in France, decided to rehabilitate the non-calibrated and unperfect fruits and vegetables. So we launch Les Fruits et Légumes Moches, the inglorious fruits and vegetables, starring the grotesque apple, the ridiculous potato, the hideous orange, the failed lemon, the disfigured eggplant, the ugly carrot, and the unfortunate clementine. Now, you can eat five inglorious fruits and vegetables a day. As good, but 30% cheaper. How did we do it? We bought from our growers the products they usually throw away and sold them in stores. They got their own aisle, their own labelings, and their own spot on the sales receipt. For people to realize that they were just as good as the others, we designed and distributed inglorious vegetable soups and inglorious fruit juices. And it worked. Our new kind of fruits and vegetables were an immediate success. We faced only one problem, being sold out. 1.2 tons average sale per store during the first two days, plus 24% overall store traffic. This initiative increased awareness about food waste. Mais c'est très bien ce que vous faites. C'est très bien. Il y a assez de gâchis comme ça. It created a lot of conversation in social networks. Over 13 million people reached after one month and had a big impact in the media. Finally, journalists suggested that every supermarket in the country should do that. Et moi je milite pour que ça continue que ça soit sur dans tous les supermarchés de Bonne idée. The inglorious fruits and vegetables, a glorious fight against food waste. That, that was great. I remember that uh, the one time I've seen the word inglorious used was in connection with a movie. I won't mention the last name here, but this was a lot better. I want you to know that. Uh, so I'm delighted. We are now at one of the most popular sessions of our program. That is the lightning rounds. And to kick off this session, I'm pleased to welcome to the podium Alison Aubrey from NPR. I think she's here, and everybody's heard of you, so it's glad, glad that you're here, and I think you have a group of people with you. Yes, thank, thank you. you. Okay. Nice to meet you. Hi. Great to be here today. We've got a really fascinating group for you. I want to just introduce the panel one by one. They'll give a three to five minute um, talk, and then we'll sit down for a conversation. So first out today, David Fleming is PATH's Vice President of Public Health Impact, um, <clears throat> which is, as many of you know, recognized as a real global health innovation engine. Um, he oversees programs in reproductive health, maternal and child health, uh, nutrition, malaria control, HIV AIDS, and uh, tuber tuberculosis. He's trained as a physician, but has had lots of um, different career um, points in his career before joining PATH last year. Dr. Fleming served as the Director and Health Officer for Public Health at Seattle and King County. Prior to that, Dr. Fleming was Director of Global Health Strategies at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, where he oversaw a grant portfolio of more than a billion dollars. Dr. Fleming also served as Deputy Director at the uh, CDC. He is a Clinical Associate Professor at the University of Washington School of Public Health. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce to you Dr. David Fleming. Uh, good afternoon. I'm in a little bit of trouble because there it is. Thank you. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here today. It's been a long day with a lot of really stimulating discussion around nutrition, malnutrition, and the role of the food industry. I'd like to talk with you during the next five minutes a little bit about the role that innovation, and particularly collaborative innovation, can play in getting us on the path that we need to get going towards. We're really at a quite remarkable time right now in the world of nutrition. It's almost a double tipping point globally. On one hand, as you, we've been talking today, we have profound uh, undernutrition, both protein and calories, as well as minerals and vitamins. 
And at the same time, we have this impending and, in fact, actual epidemic of obesity and diabetes that is complicating all of our lives and, remarkably, is occurring in exactly the same countries together, in exactly the same localities, and in many instances, in the same people, including the same children. Here's a slide that uh, reflects the undernutrition problem globally over the past 15 years. The uh, green bars are hundreds of millions of children who are stunted globally. The blue bars are those uh, children who are suffering from anemia, but for which iron deficiency is a common cause. If you're an optimist, you could look at this and say, maybe there's been a little bit of progress. I think a realist would say, no, we're stagnating. Uh, we have not made the progress that we need to make. And the reality is today, in 2015, 45% of all deaths in kids have nutrition as an underlying cause, and that's 3 million children a year who are dying. That is a number that is unacceptable to all of us. And let's try this. At the same time, we have this epidemic of obesity and diabetes. This is, again, hundreds of millions now of adults with the orange bars representing uh, prevalence rates of overweight and the yellow bars actual diabetes. 7% of the world's population today has diabetes. And the remarkable thing about both of these problems, in contrast to Alzheimer's disease or some forms of cancer, is that they are 100% preventable. And that's the challenge that we need to take on. They're not going to be prevented by the healthcare industry. There's not a magic vaccine for this. Instead, there's something much more elegant and simple, and that's food. And we all eat food, and therefore we need to be looking to the food sector to partner with us together to solve this problem. And we can do it. Why can I be um, so optimistic? Well, I'm lucky to work at PATH. PATH has been in existence for about 40 years. We work in 70 countries with civil society, with academics, with governments, with the private sector. And together, these partnerships have created amazing change through innovation. And many of the world's problems in health are on the verge of being solved because of that innovation. Let me give you one example that relates a little bit to food. And it's the relationship between vaccines and chicken which might not immediately come to mind what that relationship is, but both of those products actually require transport from where they are produced to where they are used, and that transport oftentimes requires uh, encounters conditions, particularly heat, that could, for chicken, spoil it, or for a vaccine, make it so it does not work any longer. 1980s, PATH started working with a company called TempTime that had been developing a new dye that changed color when it was exposed to temperature, and they were thinking about using it on produce and chicken to mark whether or not the produce had gone bad. We talked with them and said, you know, this makes perfect sense um, when you're thinking about vaccines. Because right now, on the front line, um, we, were, um, we, we have healthcare workers who are being forced to make decisions around vaccines, not knowing whether they're good or bad. We created this vial with temp time, and this vial has resulted in delivery of immunizations to children. Um, five billion doses of vaccine have now been delivered with this product, and it's been great for temp time as well, because temp time is now a thriving global business. What does innovation look like in salt, in, in, uh, in nutrition? And the answer is salt. Um, salt uh, is something that we all eat, and it was really over 100 years ago that we discovered that iodized salt can prevent the leading cause of intellectual and developmental disability in the world, um, iodine deficiency. This is a tremendous uh, innovation. It's been now spread around the world uh, in the 1990s in many developing countries. And the characteristics of this innovation are, first, that it's inherently scalable. It's something that um, you can uh, easily scale up. Second, um, it's a private sector solution. It does not require continued infusion of money. It's in, in inherently fundable. And third, it's integrated into the food system and therefore is a food system solution for a health problem. Now, there are opportunities for many more innovative breakthroughs in nutrition if we play our cards right now. I will quickly talk about four of them. One of them you've heard about, a partnership with Abbott to create fortified rice 
rice um, that is in fact um, supplemented with small amounts of pasta that look like rice, that contain uh, uh, vitamins and minerals, and it cooks and tastes exactly like rice, except it's a lot more healthy. Um, this is a product, Ultra Rice, that we've now licensed in the US, in Myanmar, in Brazil. You're about to hear about the efforts in Mali. And in fact, um, is creating a huge opportunity to take the staple that 50% of the world's population eats and make it more healthy. Second, we've talked this morning about the need for um, nutritional innovations to allow for healthier protein to mothers and infants. Um, one of the ways that we can potentially do that is through insects. And we are, PATH is working right now with entrepreneurs in different parts of the country to make that happen. Third, um, gut health. Increasingly, we're realizing it's not important only what you eat, but whether your intestines are prepared to absorb that. And so the bacteria that you have in your intestines are a critical part of what we should be thinking about relative to nutrition. There are products out there that actually can help increase the health of the gut, particularly in mothers and infants. And again, we are working with folks around the world to try to get those to market. And then finally, at the end of the day, all food is prepared. Home economics is probably a discipline that is in the past, but we still need to make sure that those preparers of food are educated. And um, using new techniques, social media techniques, remarkable progress is being made on this in the poorest parts of the world, educating uh, girls and women in uh, families in India to, more, um, to prepare food that is not only easy and cheap to prepare, but good for their family. So, for examples, all of these same, share those same characteristics in common in that they are, by virtue of their nature, inherently scalable, which they have to be. They are private sector and therefore are sustainable. And perhaps most importantly, they are solutions that are health solutions, but they're solutions that reside within the food industry. Um, and that's the key partnership that's here. So in conclusion, looking forward into the future, um, when we started with these graphs, we could extrapolate them out and predict the future, but actually we should not because the future instead is in our hands. We have the choice for how these um, uh, conditions are going to be in the future. It's within our grasp, but it is going to take all of us. Thank you very much. Next, we're going to hear from Salif Romano Niang. Salif is the co-founder and chief impact officer at Malo, which is a social enterprise in Mali. And the mission is to combat farmer poverty and chronic malnutrition. Um, Malo designs and builds facilities that can process and fortify rice grown by small, heart, small uh, holder farms. And, um, in doing so, they add a lot of the essential vitamins and minerals to the rice to make it a nutritious food. So without further ado, Salif Romano Neon. Good afternoon, everyone. So in 2010, about five years ago, I was a PhD student at Purdue studying political science, specifically looking at some of the causes of conflict and, and some, of the, some of the theories behind uh, why countries go democratic. And my younger brother, um, who was a business student at Temple at the time, sent me an email and said, look, you know, I'm, I'm a business student. There's a business plan competition out in Seattle. Um, it's $10,000, prize money. I was a gra pretty broke graduate student at the time. And I said, you know what, I'll help you write uh, the business plan, even though I've never written a business plan before. I've written lots of research papers. And we ended up submitting this idea to help reduce post-harvest losses in the rice sector in Mali, um, specifically by introducing better storage and milling uh, capacity. So it was very uncertain. I was not you know, in, my, in my comfort zone. And we ended up presenting this plan uh, to folks at Microsoft and the Gates Foundation and, uh, and you know, business leaders from Starbucks. And the reaction was phenomenal. And one of the persons in that audience was Dr. Jackie Sherris, who used to work at PATH as well. And after we got done, she said, before you guys leave and go back to school, you need to get in my Prius, and we're going to the PATH headquarters to meet the Ultra Rice team. And it was such a humbling experience because we never considered nutrition. We were so focused on quantity, like 
can we reduce waste in order to increase quantity? By increasing quantity, we increase the amount of money we earn, pass some of those profits to the farmers, the rest we keep as, as profit. So we left determined to go and transform the rice sector in, in Mali. And just one quick slide to kind of give you a sense just of the macro aspect. Whether it's Mali, Senegal, or Cote d'Ivoire, production is increasing, but consumption is increasing faster than production. And one thing from this slide I think that's important, we haven't really talked about in this notion of food secure nutrition, is the role of conflict. And you see that blue line, that's Cote d'Ivoire. The Cote d'Ivoire went through a decade of crisis and, and the production of rice just plummeted. And they're just right now starting to recover. So that's something we need to really keep in, in mind. What role does security, violence, and conflict play when we talk about feeding the next you know, 10 billion people? So why are countries like Mali not able to keep up with demand? So one part of it is obviously putting more acreage under cultivation, growing more rice. But rice, by definition, takes processing. It's an industrial product in a, in a sense. You need mills, you need storage, you need silos, you need trucks to take the rice to, to the consumers. And for the last 25, 30 years, there's been very little investment in modern commercial mills. So this is one of the biggest commercial mills and the biggest rice produ production zone in Mali. And since the early 90s, it's been basically obsolete. Um, with the structural adjustment programs, most of these uh, commercial mills were privatized. And unfortunately, and what we learned was that most of the people that bought, up, bought those mills were actually importers. So they actually had no incentive to keep these open. So they essentially bought them to kill them because they were benefiting by importing cheap rice from international markets. So about 80% of all the rice grown in Mali is processed using these type of machines. It's an Engelberg type huller. It does the job, but not very well, especially in 2015. But farmers had, absolutely had no choice. You know, if you leave your patty and you don't have proper storage or place, you know, uh, proper drying mechanisms, you might end up losing the entire harvest. So we see, saw this as an incredible opportunity to provide proven technology in order to reduce the amount of waste due to inefficient milling, at the same time add vitamins in the process. So that was really our business challenge. That was our, we finally found what our focus was, what our, what our uh, priority was. And some of the statistics, just to give you a sense, just by improving the efficiency rate, say from 55% to 62%, based on USAID studies, can result in over $20 million of extra value for farmers. That might not sound like a lot of money, but for farmers making $1.25 a day, that is huge. So for us, it just made, you know, made sense. This, is, this was the right approach to go. Now, the other uncertain aspect that we found was that a lot of commercial millers had one very big challenge when it came to building rice mills. It was securing raw material. If you're not growing your own rice, you need to source it. And a lot of those companies that opened up shop were not a business for two primary reasons. One, they weren't fair. They're really trying to drive farmers. The new farmers are vulnerable. The new farmers didn't have a place to store the rice. The new farmers were desperate. So they just basically tried to screw the farmers. And farmers really resented that. And would rather see a mill go out of business or mill their own rice than sell to a predatory company. So we talked about ultra rice shortly. And what you see here is, is the beauty of the, of the technology. On the right side is the ultra rice grain. You know, it's reconstituted rice. It's rice flour. It's broken rice, which is a byproduct of your milling, added with micronutrients, and it can fortify up to 100 grains. And it's also a little metaphor for us uh, being in Mali. We often feel like we're that little grain of rice on that palm against all the problems on, on the other side. But you know, we're, we're, we're doing our best. So in Mali, there's an overwhelming preference for local rice, but there's simply no supply. You know, people want to eat good quality local rice, but increasingly in urban areas, folks are turning towards imported varieties. Not out of you know, with the, uh, pure choice, but out of, out of necessity. And again, we see that as a very interesting opportunity to address multiple problems uh, at once. And so the technology, the equipment that's available is extremely affordable, effective, and efficient. And it's just an example of a, of a paddle mixer, a four-brick type mixer that allows you to blend the rice very quickly, very efficiently at the desired ratio. And the Rasta man you see on the, on the right is the Bob Marley of West Africa today. We really believe involving celebrities, people that have the youth in particular, have their attention, should be able to promote those ideas. And I just wanted to say 
uh, without partners like Path and Gain, this would not be possible. It's very difficult to do business in, in Mali to start an enterprise anywhere in the world. But when you're dealing with the coup, rebellion, and all kinds of you know, externalities, that's very, very challenging. So I just want to say thank you to all, all of you for your attention. And thank you. Thank you. Next up, we have Jenny Schmidt. She owns and operates a family farm along with her husband and two children. It's a third generation farm that produces greens, vegetables, hay, and wine grapes on the eastern shore of Maryland. Um, her farm's mission is to practice what she calls synergistic farming, using the best of all the farming methods to create healthy soil and to, uh, to sustain healthy food production. I give you Jenny Schmidt. <clears throat> Thank you. I'm so happy to be here. I've been anxious to get on stage all day because my degree in nutrition and farming, this is um, exactly why 26 years ago I studied for, uh, nutrition and international agriculture. So my family farm is on the eastern shore. This is an open invitation. Anybody who wants to come visit, we're an hour and a half uh, east of here on the Delmarva Peninsula. Uh, we are what we call a supermarket farm. So we don't do any direct-to-consumer sales. Uh, we're too big. Um, and at 2,000 acres, my father-in-law made some very good business decisions back when land was 25 bucks an acre in the 40s and 50s. So our is strictly a wholesale operation that we sell to processors that end up in your grocery store, such as spaghetti sauce and stewed tomatoes and those types of things. Um, we are very diversified. We, we grew 1.5 million pounds of green beans last year. Uh, summer and 7.2 million pounds of tomatoes, which is why we don't belong at a farmer's market, um, because that is not an appropriate size to be selling at a, at a farmer's market. So somebody does supply the food that is in, your, in the grocery stores. And as we said, we practice what we call synergistic farming. Um, so what we do, because we have done biotechnology, we are conventional for the sake of calling modern agriculture conventional, and we've also been certified organic. We've done all three of those things simultaneously. And so what we have done now is taken the best of each practice of each farming system and integrated them into our farming, our family farm. Um, and that's what works best in terms of soil health, which is why this picture of dirt is so important to me, because that is how we earn a living. And that is how the next generation of our family farm, which is three generations in the US, and for decades and generations before that in Germany, um, are able to sustain the land that, that we have. So this slide shows you the different farming systems and how we take each one of them. We use components of precision agriculture in what we call modern ag or conventional. We use the enhanced traits. And I'm not just talking about genetic engineering. I'm talking about biotechnology as a whole in terms of plant breeding. That science is so important to us as we do go forward into climate change to be able to continue to grow healthy food on healthy soils. Um, and, within or, and within the organic philosophy, we look at what the components are of soil health, because especially here in the Chesapeake Bay region, we know we have a sediment and phosphorus problem. We know we need to keep our nutrients in the soil, because to me, they're nutrients, but when they get to the water, they're pollution. And so we need to be able to integrate those practices to bring the best synergies to how we produce food um, for, for our our country. Soil characteristics. So these are the things that make a difference in terms of how we grow food and how nutritious our food is. So soil obviously is very important to anybody who's growing a crop. So we're looking at the, way, the things that impact the nutrients that are in the soil based on the structure and the tilth and the pH and the temperature and the CEC. CEC is cation exchange capacity, the amount of positively charged ions in the soil that retain the most nutrients. So all of those things are really important. And as farmers, we pay attention to them. Okay? I, I don't think many farmers communicate that because, as my husband would say, leave me alone and let me drive my tractor, <laughs> which is why I'm here today. <laughs> the biggest factor is pH. So a plant is not going to take up the nutrients that that plant needs to grow without the pH being correct, without the temperature being correct. We haven't planted anything yet because our soil temperatures are still in the 40s. Okay? Phosphorus is not available to the plant 
at temperatures in the 40s. So the nutrients may be there, but the temperature is wrong. So it does us absolutely no good to be planting anything with soil temperatures in the 40s. This is how innovation starts. This is my father-in-law on a very innovative piece of equipment from the 1960s. I would call it a dinosaur now, but that was us back in the 60s when we started no-till farming and started cover crops. So conservation is front of mind to many, many of us in the agriculture industry today. This is innovation today. For those of you who are in healthcare, this is what I call TPN on a farm, total parental nutrition, IV nutrition. So what we're looking at on the left is an optical eye. This is a machine called a green seeker. And it's scanning the vegetative index of the um, chlorophyll in the plants. The spray boom that you see on the right is adjusting variable rate nitrogen and other nutrients that are in the tank. So that white tank that's on the back of the sprayer is adjusting the fertilizer based on what the crop needs. So we're saving a huge amount of resources. We're doing no-till agriculture, so we're saving a lot of sediment. We're applying exactly what the crop needs. And that's the innovation that we need going forward to be able to produce healthy foods with the limited resources that we can save um, from the farm. Summary slide of these, uh, these are practices for eat. For us, these are standard operating procedures. A lot of people will call these organic practices. For us, IPM, cover crops, green manures, crop rotation, they are part of the synergies that I think more and more family farms are adopting to move agriculture along the sustainability continuum. It's prescriptive, it's data-driven. You've heard talks about data uh, throughout the day. We use manure analysis. Yes, we look at it, we analyze it, we see what the actual content is. This is why me as a dietitian, I will look at somebody's blood test and somebody's CBC and chem panel, the same thing. We're looking at soil tests, we're looking at manure tests, we're looking at plant tissue tests. And bringing that data together means that we're using exactly what the crop needs, limiting what we're putting out, which is really beneficial for us on the financial side, because if you're not sustainable on the financial side, what kid is gonna come back to the farm with a negative checkbook balance? So if we're looking for the next generation to come back to the farm, the farm has to be profitable, or there's no incentive for them to come back to the family farm. Thank you. I have a split personality on social media, so any of those options are, are for you. Thank you. Roger Thoreau is a senior fellow at the Chicago Council on Global Affairs and an author. Uh, but before joining the council, he was a foreign correspondent for the Wall Street Journal for more than 20 years, based in Europe and Africa. His most recent book is called The Last Hunger Season. It's about a year in an African farm community on the brink of change. And he's now working on a fascinating new project called A Thousand Days. So I'll let him tell you more about it. I bring to you Roger Thoreau. Thank you, Allison. It's great to be here with all my colleagues from the Chicago Council and from all my sources uh, for this book and other projects through the year, all the, all the way back to when I was uh, with, uh, with the Wall Street Journal. Uh, and so as they know, and as, as some of you know, I've been on a uh, most fascinating journalistic journey through what I think many here believe is the most uh, critical period of individual human development. It's the thousand days through a woman's pregnancy to the second birthday of her child, and the uh, tremendous uh, uh, importance on nutrition and everything that goes along with it uh, that comes uh, from that. And so what I'm attempting to do is to bring the thousand days to life by following women and their children uh, in India, Uganda, Guatemala, and Chicago through the thousand days. And hopefully to put faces and emotions to all the facts and figures and statistics and uh, numbers that we've heard. Because after all, statistics, numbers are people. And people have emotions and experiences and that's what I'm trying to, 
uh, capture. Now, I'm at about day 850 or so of my journey, maybe 900, depending on the country that I'm going to next. Uh, and uh, uh, so all the children are about to turn uh, two years old. So hooray, it'll be uh, uh, a culmination of my travels, but also uh, some celebration in those uh, places. And so I will attempt to summarize uh, my reporting uh, through that time in these next five minutes or so. Megan, we can start the clock now, right? So, five minutes. so what that basically comes down to is 200 days per minute um, is what I figure. But I can boil it down to three essential uh, universal truths or elements or observations. They may seem obvious, but given the context in which this information and, and, and these truths appear, they can be uh, really genuinely revolutionary. They may seem simple, but the execution and the implementation of these things is anything but simple. And therein lies the story, therein lies the tale, and therein lies the narrative of my Thousand Days book, which hopefully is out next year at about this time, so for Mother's Day uh, 2016. So mark that on your calendars. Um, so number one, eat your vegetables. Eat your vegetables, your fruits, your proteins, all the rainbow foods that Lindiwe talked about today. What that requires then is diversified diets, which come from diversified agriculture. So again, agriculture we've heard so often today, uh, vital that it has, it's nutrition sensitive and, and really uh, pays attention to the nutritional aspects. Here we have little Aaron in uh, northern Uganda. He's eating an orange flesh sweet potato uh, he just grabs it with his hands. His mom, Brenda, had boiled it. Uh, and, and Brenda is growing these herself uh, in her field. She's part of uh, uh, a new Harvest Plus initiative in northern Uganda, uh, where the farmers are growing, and many of them are women, are growing uh, orange flesh sweet potatoes, rich in, vitamins, rich in vitamin A, and in the high iron beans with an elevated uh, iron content. And so obviously, good nutrition for mother and child in the 1,000 days is vital for the child's physical and mental development that we've been hearing so much about today, and it sets up a child for healthy growth and development uh, throughout their lives. Now, the teaching of uh, these, uh, these messages and the message of, of eat your vegetables and have a diversified diet and things uh, is being conveyed in pretty much the same manner all over the world. So whether it's, it's midwife Susan in northern Uganda on a veranda in a clinic talking to dozens of moms-to-be and moms. And she's got her nutrition chart there with the main food groups and the vital and uh, the vitamins and nutrients and everything that's so important. Or whether it's in a community center in Guatemala where uh, Yolanda and uh, Maria Estela are putting food shapes that are kind of you know, cut out of paper or cloth with some Velcro and they're putting them on a, a pot, which they use in Guatemala for their food pyramid. Uh, and things, and so it's the proper elements and nutrients to go in there. And so what I found is that this knowledge is truly empowering. Knowledge is power, certainly empowering for these women. But what I've also found is that a powerful counterweight is poverty. So all these women are saying, I hear it everywhere, be it from moms who are on the public distribution system in, in, uh, in India, or moms in the south side of Chicago who are on the WIC and the SNAP program that, yeah, we hear everything, we get it, we understand what we're supposed to eat, but we can't afford it. Do you know how much vegetables are? Do you know how much fruits are? I hear that universally. Two, wash your hands. Everywhere, every nutrition, Lesson intervention that I see begins with washing hands. Whether it's, again, Aaron and his mom Brenda washing their hands in Uganda, or it's Quintana and her daughter uh, Shailon uh, in Chicago. The hand washing essential for all those elements that support good nutrition. The wash elements, water, sanitation, hygiene. Bad water, lousy sanitation, poor hygienic practices, basically undermine everything that is going on with the other teaching that we need to have all these elements and nutrients uh, in our bodies because that will all lead to 
uh, illness, infection, dysentery, diarrhea that washes all the nutrients out of the body, uh, and uh, uh, then also leads to parasites, worms, that will absorb the nutrients instead of the host body itself. So the third basic element, when I ask all the moms and their dads and parents all over the world, no matter where I am, what are your goals and your aspirations for this little one? Everyone says, good education. Be it Esther and her son Rogers in Uganda, or at the bottom, uh, Jessica and uh, Alitzel in Chicago, or Gabriella and Suseli in Guatemala, or um, Sanju and her husband and their son Ardarsh in India. It's, uh, it, 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 it's all the same. Education is so important. And the vital thing then for education it begins in a thousand days. The realization of that goal, a good education, begins in a thousand days because that's where the stunting begins. If that doesn't happen, this is what happens. We've heard so much about stunting today. It's a harsh, ugly, horrible word, stunting, to be stunted. This is little Hargirso. He's a boy I met in Ethiopia in 2003 in an emergency feeding tent during the, the famine of, of Ethiopia. He was on the verge and doorstep of starvation. Fortunately, Hargirso survived. But to what quality of life did he survive? I went back 10 years later and he was a teenager. And there he is, clearly, manifestly, physically stunted compared to the size of his dad. To me, he comes up to about my waist. Good news was, Hargirso was in school. So hooray for that, Hargirso was in school. I said, where's your school? He said, it's right down the road. So I went and saw him in school. He's in first grade. He's a teenager in first grade learning his alphabet. He's the same age, or he's, he looks the same as, as, as his fellow students who are six, seven, eight, nine years old uh, in his class. And to me, Hargirso is the manifestation of everything that we've been talking about and the cost of malnutrition and stunting. The lost productivity, the lost wages, the lost work, the lost health, the health cost, and how that manifests itself, not only for Hargirso, but Ethiopia is calculating that malnutrition and stunting cost the country about 16% of its GDP every year. And then there's the opportunity cost. What might a child like Hargirso have accomplished and contributed to all of us in society were they not stunted? So that's what's at stake in, 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 in everything that we're talking about and what's at stake in the, in the thousand days. And again, it comes down to, and we've heard the statistics so often, one in four children is stunted. Think of that, one in four children. We can do better, we can certainly do far, far better, and it all begins in a thousand days, and so many of you here are continuing with that. So I hope that a year from now, when the book comes out, you'll, uh, you'll read all about it. Thank you. Shen Tong is a serial entrepreneur, uh, an angel investor, a foodie, a social activist, a writer, poet, and a film buff. Um, his claim to fame is that in 1989, Shen was an organizer of the democracy movement um, that occupied Tiananmen Square while he was a student at Beijing University. Um, skip forward 26 years or so, and his latest venture is called Food X. It's a food business accelerator program, so it brings it invests in early stage food companies and supports them with funding and mentorship programs to bring them to scale. So I bring to you Shen Tong. Um, so it's, uh, it's so hard to eat, right? And I was, uh, right? And don't you feel the same way? It is so difficult to eat, right? Especially as a father of three young children. I mean, I was uh, uh, at a similar event in Milan last week, and uh, it was a spring break, so my, my daughter was uh, traveling. I took my 10-year-old daughter, and uh, uh, I was so busy I didn't pack food for, for a long-haul flight, which I would normally do, and uh, so we end up starving on, on, on this flight. And uh, they, uh, there was one moment uh, my daughter learned to uh, read labels um, fairly early on, uh, when it comes to food, and uh, so she was going through the uh, the snack box. I think it was dinner, and she was throwing things out and, and onto uh, is a hot sauce. 
Can everyone hear me? Yeah. Yes. So she was uh, going through the snack box, throwing things out. And at one moment, she turned to me. She said, Dad, there is a gum in the, in the cookie. So apparently, I happen to have the gum that uh, she was reading. This is like a little novel. She was reading it, and then, and then she, she threw that away. And then she uh, was reading the, uh, this uh, class plastic package of this perfect looking uh, golden brown cookie. And apparently, the ingredients in the gum, uh, most of it is in, in the cookie as well. So she threw that away. And then you know we were having bottled water. Actually, the only item we, we ate shared this is a small pack of dried cranberry, but that is flavored, artificial flavored by two other fruits. I don't know why. So that was the only thing we ate before we get to the hotel in Milan. So uh, we, we know, people in this room, we know that's not an isolated instance. I mean, that's not the, the just airline. You know. Roughly about two thirds of all the food we have today are really food look-alike objects. Some of them don't even, are not even food look-alike objects. Right? So, the, uh, so, so you, 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 ha you have that uh, uh, two-third or so, or maybe even more, uh, of a one point four, just US, one point four trillion dollar uh, annual revenue industry. Right? And underneath that, you have agriculture. Now it's well understood that uh, farming practices, like the farm earlier in this session I talked about, or independent family farms that, that leverage nature feed to three quarter roughly of the world population using only a quarter of the natural resources, right? 16 times difference in terms of efficiency versus industrial farming, right? And underneath that, you have uh, soil and water, right? So all about soil and water, right? So when for, for a innovator and a serial entrepreneur and for a venture capitalist, when we see, when I see that, when I see huge efficiencies like that, there seems to be a big opportunity there. Right? But then that coupled with the fact that not only my daughter, but uh, there's a growing proportion of the population that's a global population that's, that's increasing in number and becoming mainstream, really read the labels. They really want to know where it comes from, whether it's tasty, whether it's healthy, and whether it's uh, tasty and healthy for their children, children, children. In other words, whether they are sustainable. Right? So when you have the opportunity that we, you think this is what people need, and then people telling you this is what they want also, right? And you have a system that's called a complex system that's called nature, that's really resilient. You know, as much as we're depleting uh, nutrients and, and uh, um, destroying earth and water, it can quickly recover because that's the way nature is, right? So you have those three elements together, that's where food acts come from. We look at all this and say, here is a real opportunity where if you can create a platform that really enable the little guys, you know, the eaters, the families, uh, the, the, the health conscious young children and uh, entrepreneurs and, uh, and, and uh, innovators who are really mostly hungry for real change, lasting change in our food, health, and natural systems then we may have a compelling alternative to the current state of food and health. And uh, uh, that's what we try to do in FoodX. We use, uh, and, and this opportunity is not just for profit. We see it as an opportunity for people and for the planet as well. People, planet, and profit. So we use triple bottom line approach and uh, we want to create this commercial alternative to current food system 10 startups at a time. So we take 10 startups out of uh, anywhere between uh, a few hundred, 300 up to 500 applicants every half year. So that makes uh, 20 uh, companies minimum a year. We bring them, the funding team, uh, to uh, New York and, uh, and provide high power mentor partner, uh, men mentoring and industry partnership, and particularly business coaching on product market fit and not just any product, not, not just any market, the way in which I just described, the triple bottom line approach to the product market and focusing on scalability. You need to be highly scalable to become a compelling uh, alternative. So, uh, and, uh, and in order to fill, in order to provide the engine, the power behind this, we, we have our fund has uh, uh, over $200 uh, million and it's, uh, so not only during the accelerator, which we give them the award to come to New York to, to give them uh, investment, but after that, 
we've, we've followed multiple stages of, uh, uh, of investment directly from us and from our strategic investment uh, ecosystem. So, um, the, uh, so, so you can do the math, we, we, we're, we're patient, right? Not only we're triple bottom line, we're patient. We have a minimum 10 year time horizon, atypical for investment fund. So, uh, so we're looking at uh, uh, 200 up to 500 companies through the accelerator and the direct investment in, uh, in a period of uh, uh, 10 years. And hopefully we're also, we can't do this alone. We're also trying to create this ecosystem uh, to, uh, to invest in this big opportunity. This, this, this opportunity, to put it simply, is one of those rare opportunities in life where not only uh, you can do good, but you can do really well by doing good. You know, so I've been through a very social movement, and it's very, very rarely that you can, um, you know, you all know no good deeds goes unpunished. Right? But this time it's different. You know, we're not going to punish, we're going to be rewarded. And we can do really well by doing that good because uh, nature is very resilient. You know, when we restore nature and leverage its resilience, it's going to reward us uh, deliciously with its self-sustaining uh, abundance. Thank you. Thank you, Shin. <clears throat> I think one of the great things about conferences like this is that you get to meet people who've been in the trenches for 20 or 30 years working in nutrition or international development, and then you meet people who are really close to that moment of epiphany when I hear Salif talk about the moment he realized that, wow, he might be able to do something to improve nutrition, um, that he could make a difference, and the enthusiasm and the sense of urgency that comes with that, coupled with the idea that there is economic opportunity here, I think is a powerful combination. So weaving together all of the deep reserves of knowledge of everybody here who have maybe have academic backgrounds and maybe in it from more maybe you know people who are you know in the weeds, uh, looking at data, academics who've been looking at this from all their different siloed positions, whether it be international development or nutrition, weaving this all together is, is fabulous. I think one of the things I'm, I'm interested in here at this conference, we keep hearing a lot about um, behavior and behavior change. So a lot of technological inter um, interventions <coughs> that have been important, innovations that have been important, for instance, Salif in your project, um, realizing that you have the technology to fortify the rice has been the big beginning of your business. I'm interested now, what comes next? How is it that you can build this business and get consumers, people in Mali, to want your product? Um, do you have to build a brand around it? Do you have to convince them that this is the superior product since it's fortified with, with minerals and so forth? Sure. Um, so in, in our market trials, what we found was quite fascinating was that people, uh, the folks that were buying our rice and testing it, the first comment was that it tasted good. So taste, you find across the board, is extremely important. Nutritious, nutrition was important, but the fact that the rice you didn't have to pick rocks out of it. Mm -hmm. You bought a 10 kilogram bag, you got 10 kilos. So we found in the market when you buy a 50 kilogram bag, you actually get 48.5. And that's how a lot of the rice resellers kind of make a little bit of margin. So little things like that go a long way and build goodwill with, 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 the, with the consumer. Now, the fortification aspect is important for our consumers because once you get used to something, you don't want it taken away from you. And as an as a entrepreneur, one of our biggest challenges was if we're gonna really push fortified rice in Mali, we gotta make sure that we can continue producing fortified rice. So a lot of, for example, our retail partners that helped us during the market trial said we were willing to you know, use our reputations, you know, selling rice for 10, 15, 20 years to push this product, but we need to make sure that once we do so, supply will come. And that's been our biggest challenge, is ensuring that we can you know, have the right partners, have the right funding support, have the right model to ensure that we, there's no, this is not a three-year product or a four-year product that we can be here you know, for the very long term. And then the branding, I think, is important as, as an entrepreneur because you know, if, if we, for example, want to go to Senegal, you know, we're not going to want to export rice to Senegal. 
we want to work with Senegalese rice farmers, but we can export the brand <laughs> and then take it, take it from there. So we're really looking, you know, we say this sometimes, to be the, the Uncle Ben of Africa for the fight rice one day. So that's really kind of our, our, <laughs> our uh, you know, that kind of, kind of motivates us. Is that a brand that's known in Africa? Obviously, you're not looking to replicate that, but. Um. <laughs> some people say, unfortunately, Uncle Ben's in some countries is, is all people eat, right? Um, <laughs> Uh, yes, it's Uncle Ben's is something that is uh, that is known, and there's also parallel there in that that's what that's what basically I forget his name, but he invented parboiling, right? And parboiled rice uh, was a way to take the nutrients um, from you know from the process, processing stage and put it back into rice to increase increase its nutritional value. So there is a little bit of a parallel there with parboiling and fortifying rice using ultra rice technology, for example. Got it, uh, Shen Tong. The concept of doing well by doing good. Wondering um, when people come to you, pitch their, their product, their company, they're looking for investment. Um, what is it that makes you say, aha, I, I see something here. I see where uh, this is a business model where you know, it's people, it's planet, it's profit, it, it's all there. Uh, it, it's worth it. Can you give us a little bit of, a, of an insider take on what you're looking for? Well, we are, we are, you know, there are, there are uh, other centers of innovation that uh, hold a bar of uh, an idea have to be able to uh, impact a billion people who are not that ambitious. It's about 100 million. You know, we look at uh, uh, whether an idea that has that potential uh, and uh, then, of course, the most important thing is uh, whether the uh, funding team, especially at this early stage, uh, when I say funding team, it's at uh, this core to our, uh, our uh, uh, Secret sauce that uh, uh, it's we don't take single founders. So uh, so it's about creating a solution community, starting with the way in which uh, entrepreneurs see themselves, how they pivot, how they uh, really capture the, the momentum, creating the alternatives. And and there are also five other filters uh, that we consider them as mission filters. There's a total 19 main filters. Um, it's uh, whether something uh, whether it's uh, promoting good taste. Yeah, that seems to actually tie everything together. It's, we're still part of nature, so is food, and it should be. And then uh, whether it's healthy, it's uh, sustainable in, in various ways defined, and uh, uh, whether it promote individual communal responsibilities, such as any, any app that, that encourages people, make it easier to cook in the kitchen. So that would, that would be an example, right? And whether it's, uh, by design, disruptive to the current, uh, uh, current practice. Got it. Um, Roger, I'm, I'm curious to know, there's been a lot of talk here um, today just looking at when is the best time to, to talk to women of childbearing age about, about nutrition, when and where, what's the best way to, to message this. As you've gone through this process and as you're reporting this thousand day pro uh, project, um, what has struck you uh, about this? What has surprised you? And, and what do you think the answer to that question is? Yeah, I mean, that, that's a really good question that a lot of people have thought about and are asking. And I think that, that pregnant women and new moms, moms-to-be and new moms, are probably the people most primed to learn, to ask questions, to be curious about things. Even if they've already had uh, a child or two or three before, they're wondering, well, what's new? Uh, is there something better I can do for my child this time around? Um, and the other thing I think that's really crucial is then uh, the aspects, not only the, the, the kind of the teaching, uh, and spreading the, the awareness of these things that so many groups are starting to do, to, to do on the ground and that's wonderful, uh, is then the behavior change component that comes with it. That it's not just enough to say, here's what you should do, and again, so it, it, it's the knowledge, that you want to construct things or have things evolve that the knowledge does become a burden. So there's not the burden of knowledge that these are, 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 this is more things that the women know that they should be doing, but they just can't because of, of, of the behavior change uh, practices, the, the cultural, the social norms uh, are kind of acting against that or media, uh, moderating against that, uh, or because of poverty, they just can't afford the things and do the things that they're supposed to. But I think it's a great time then to take advantage of this, this, this kind of primed learning uh, environment. Got it. Uh, Jenny, a question for you. Um, I know that as we talk about international development and, and nutrition, a very important component of it is this uh, fortification that we've heard so much about. Here domestically, where we're in a different situation, um, there's plenty of calories here and there's a little bit of a backlash against fortification. Moms don't necessarily want to serve 
you know, Fruit Loops just because they are fortified with, with vitamins they think their kids might be able to get from eating fruits and vegetables, which are um, in good supply here. From you, sitting from where you sit, you talked a lot about the importance of science. And I'm wondering, as you hear in popular culture, nutrition being talked about and food being talked about, do you think people are, are, are getting at what, um, the, the extent to which you need to rely on science to uh, further your business and stay in business as, as a farmer in this country? No, I, I don't think people think of farming as a science. Um, and it really is because when, um, when we look at soil and we look at plant health, we're looking at the data that extrapolates to what becomes food. And so it is really important to us um, you know, there's not a one-on-one -on -one correlation to what's in the soil is going to be what's in an apple or a strawberry, uh, but that there are so many uh, pieces of science that people think, I think because food is so plentiful, uh, they think that farming is easy um, and that, you know, we can just kind of sit back in our tractors and watch TV because the tractors now drive themselves, that, you know, we have an easy way. <laughs> That's not way. true. <laughs> no. <laughs> Uh, we're monitoring a lot of information. I mean, and, and the technology is so important for us to take it from where it's at now to the next stages, which is why science is so critical in both the breeding side of things as well, but that's what benefits us in our food system. Thank you. I'm going to move on to you, David. You mentioned that there are a number of different food innovations, food being more, more elegant and simple, I think you said, than trying to develop a, a vaccine, which of course is important as well. Um, you mentioned one that was interesting to me, developing alternative proteins and, and insects. Talk a little bit about Pat's work there. We talked a little bit about that this morning as well oh, okay. in the session, but, but basically the bottom line is, is that uh, people need diets that contain high, high quality animal protein and particularly in the developing world for uh, pregnant moms and kids, sometimes that's hard to come by. So we need to be creative and we also need to recognize that in much of the world, insects are a common staple item. Um, perhaps not as much attention as it needs to has been paid on how can you actually turn that into a business, a business that um, can create jobs locally uh, and a business that when you look at some of the science is actually one that is pretty sustainable and environmentally friendly. So I think it's one of the places that uh, we collectively, including PATH, need to be looking for innovation in the future to, to get moms and kids that protein that they need. Got it. Salif, you and I were talking a little bit last night. You mentioned that in addition to all the work you're doing with fortified rice, you also have a solar-powered farm, and you're trying to produce a lot of, of row crops using drip irrigation. Um, talk a little bit about, about the cha challenges and efforts there and about uh, producing these nutrient-dense dense foods in a country like Mali. Sure, sure. Um, you know, when we often think of Mali, we think of desert sand. It's the Sahel. It's right at the edge of the of the Sahara, um, but one thing we have a lot of, especially right now, is a lot of sun. And um, we have the Niger River that's, you know, basically traverses the entire country all the way from the south all the way uh, to, to Timbuktu. So the combination of solar and drip irrigation, especially solar pumps where you can go 60, 70, 80 meter, meters deep to get water, for us is really a game changer in a country like Mali. Um, we have enormous groundwater resources. If we use that you know, diligently, we can be able to grow um, food whether it rains or not. And at the same time, you know, take care of the soil, uh, correct the pH levels with, with lime and, and et cetera. So it, the way you know, I see myself, and this is a family endeavor, it's, it's my, I mean, my brothers and I kind of pushed by our father who was a Purdue PhD, so give Purdue a little bit of credit, uh, credit here. I went to Purdue as well. It was good to see my man Mitch uh, give, his, give his speech uh, 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 during lunch. And we really see this as, as young Africans, we really see this as a calling for our generation. Like we really see agriculture and food production and being a food entrepreneur as the best way, not only to drive our countries forward, but to also avoid you know, the doomsday scenario. And the doomsday scenario in a country like Mali today is lots of young people, especially young men, just absolutely desperate for opportunity and just do not see a way out. And the ones that, that I'm concerned about are the ones that work hard, have gotten education, have gone to school, and just hit a wall. Like they can't get a job in, in government, 
They can't get a job in the private sector because there's really no private sector hiring. And we see agriculture, whether it's a company like Malo that's really rice processing is completely post-harvest. So it's building plants, it's hiring mechanics, it's hiring plant operators, hiring logistics folks, um, marketers, uh, retailers, but also going back to the, to, to the ground and using tools like drip irrigation to really reduce the risk of production, I think is, is a very interesting opportunity we have ahead of us. And we're really thinking hard, how do we put that model, that all that experience we've accumulated as non-experts in agriculture. Like, I used to call myself a Google farmer because <laughs> I see a problem and I Google it and I say, what, what is that? Or take a picture and try to figure out what's going on, what's going on here. Mm -hmm. And teach those lessons to some of our, you know, our, our brothers and sisters and get them inspired uh, to go into agriculture. You mentioned something interesting last night that I'd never, I'd never thought about before. You said that um, the power of, of, you know, of this technology, clearly the power of the drip, drip irrigation is to, to bring the water there, but you mentioned when you had the solar powers and you electrified the farms, and once you electrified the farms and you had internet access and then, hey, you had TV and you might be able to watch soccer, and so you, these people who might be desperate to move to, to a city, if you show them what kind of life you could have on, on a farm that has full power, it might make them think differently about being on the farm. I guess maybe that's part of the I, 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 trying to keep people in agriculture in Mali. I, 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 absolutely, and I think where it gets really exciting and, and pretty cool is now you, now you work with architects and civil engineers and construction engineers and you design to build modern farms with efficient building materials where, like I would totally leave Bamako and go live out in the boonies. If I, made, if I could watch my Bar FC Barcelona every night and knew I had electricity, I would not be in the city, right? Because if I had all, if I had all my amenities. I think the, the reverse migration, the, you know, the rural excess that we see, we can relatively quickly reverse that if we provide those basic amenities to people. And what reduce the cost of investing in, in solar and solar capacity is increasing, cost is diminishing, what will make it even more attractive as investment if it's going towards creating wealth than purely for you know, powering TVs and, and, and refrigerators, which is also important. But uh, it changes economics a little bit. You can justify the cost of building a solar array system if it's also pumping water in order to allow you to, to generate income. Thank you. So what I want to do now is include all of you in this, this, last, con this last question. If each of you could think about how you might finish the sentence. I know that um, a month or so ago, Shen gave a, a TED talk, and he started off by saying, uh, the food movement uh, needs money, and then he said that's the end of the talk, and everyone, everyone, everyone laughed. Um, so we're going to uh, finish the question. If I were to ask you, what does the food movement, and by food movement, I mean in the broadest way of how to improve the food supply around the world, what does the food movement need? And we can start with you, Shen. The food movement needs money, I guess you would say. Yeah, the the uh, um, there is a couple other things uh, I want. I really like to mention is that. Uh, um, when we think about scaling up in the context of the, the food world, you, you just think about gigantic multinational corporations, right? But, but the, the, our, our approach and what we really look for very proactively, uh, and, and it, it becoming more and more clear that's actually a necessity for grow a good business, is scaling up by scaling out. So uh, think of a prominent example, like say eBay or, or uh, Wikipedia, right? These are, this are what's called a hive mind. I mean, it's a platform that enables people who otherwise in, in, the, in the incumbent in the old industry uh, or market couldn't have a voice, or couldn't make a, could, could, couldn't uh, harness efficiency. I mean, uh, just one example, creating online uh, matchmaking of marketplaces uh, in, in the U.S. and globally, enabling small farms who can sell, or a, a couple that sometimes with brick and mortar, such as uh, having uh, having logistic, small logistics centers in a uh, food desert. I mean, I'm talking about actual businesses we already invested in some multiple times, like in uh, in the, in the food desert in uh, Brooklyn, as this neighborhood Best Eye, where they they uh, this company Next Organics have their logistics center and the small farms that they, uh, they don't source pr pr previously uh, at the beginning of the business, they, 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 uh, they just bicycle their stuff in. And then the local, the neighborhood people who most of them don't have health insurance actually go to those centers uh, to, to ask about herbs. I mean, so, so that model 
And they took four years to figure out that model to be highly scalable across the country. That's what, what we're doing now to help them. That's the kind of thing that that's really can scale up by scaling up, by enabling both sides of the, the, the commerce, the, the farmers and the eaters, to be able to find what they need, bypassing the current, uh, current business models. Roger Thoreau, what do you think the food movement needs to succeed? Food movement needs to succeed is to have nutrition as the center point, as the cornerstone. The challenge in coming years is not just to feed the world, but it's to nourish the world. And that starts primarily in the, in, in the thousand days. Obviously the thousand days goes, bef if you move that forward to adolescent girls and their physical health and, and, and uh, 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 cognitive development and everything that is going as they move into the childbearing years. And so, uh, yeah, nutrition, nourishing the world, uh, in addition to, to feeding the world. Jenny Schmidt, what does the food movement need to succeed? I would answer that to say that the food movement needs the synergies of being the, flex, the flexibility of you adapting and using the tools and techniques that work in each growing region and in each soil type. So what um, synergies work on my farm are not going to work on, on your farm and not going to be extrapolated across all growing regions and all soil types. So um, to have um, attitudes that are very um, narrow in that this is the only way the farming should be operated under these set of parameters isn't going to be adaptable across all the places that need to increase food production with nutrient dense foods. Um, so to me, that's part of what we do is to try and find those synergies that work in each uh, respective location. Thank you. Salif Nyang, what does the food movement need to succeed? Um, I would say role models. Um, you know, one of the pictures I, I showed, I showed the regular artist, Tikin Jafakuli, who's from Cote d'Ivoire, but he lives in, in, in Bamako. And for the last five years, that's all he's been doing when he you know, sells out a, you know, a stadium with 60,000 people. He starts telling the youth, look, do ag, do agriculture. And, you know, we expect, like, you know, our smallholder farmers today, the people doing most of the food production today to be superheroes. And we expect them to do everything from, especially women, female farmers, from knowing when to plant, you know, uh, de-weeding and tending to the, to the fields, obviously, to the, to the household as well. And, and especially in Africa, for those of us that have been very lucky, very fortunate to have uh, an education to be able to kind of see the world and, and be able to, to know what's worked in Latin America, in the US, in Europe, I think we have an obligation to actually you know, be part of the, of the food security or the food production industry, or if I can put it that way. Because a lot of us right now are basically on the sidelines. And in particular, are actually escaping the problem you know, and going to the cities or going, uh, trying to get to Europe or going, you know, into artisanal mining, et cetera. So I really think uh, role models are essential. Um, you know, to follow, just like we have role models in basketball and soccer and music, we also need to have a couple of success stories in, you know, small scale, relatively small scale uh, food production. David Fleming, what does the food movement need to succeed? Well, from an innovation standpoint, the food industry needs to capitalize even further on the reality that health sells. Um, everybody needs to eat, and everybody wants to be healthy. Every mom wants their kid to be healthy. We talk a lot about behavior change. Um, in fact, the behaviors that we want people to engage in are exactly the same ones that they want to engage in because everybody wants to be healthy. And what we need to be doing is, from an innovation standpoint, increasingly be making it so that healthy foods are out there and represent the easy, affordable choice. And if they do, people will flock to that. I was in Guatemala last year doing a series of stories about coffee, and I was a guest um, staying with a family farm in Weiwei Tenango, uh, in the mountains, very near the Mexican border. And the farm is a beautiful place and, and has mango trees and banana trees, and they had chickens. Um, and while I was staying there, the family, the, the, the mother of the family living there went on a, on a trip one day with the teenage son and they went across the border into Mexico into a big mega store and they came back with chips and soda and they put it out for me and they were so proud that they 
um, were offering this to me, and they wanted to show me that this is the kind of thing they buy. And I think they were kind of proud of the brands more than anything. Maybe it was showing that they could afford it. And I said to them, you know what, I can get that at home. I cannot pick a mango tree in my backyard. I can't pick a banana from my backyard. I rarely have chickens, you know, f fresh chicken. I said, this is the stuff that I want. And I found it really fascinating because it felt like what we had exported to them was maybe not what we had meant to export to them, this interest in our branded food, perhaps is not so nutrient dense. Is that something that we need to do to make a cultural shift, do you think, Roger? Yeah, and, I, and what you would have also seen in, in Guatemala, and Dan referred to this and others who have been to Guatemala and elsewhere in Latin America, but particularly in Guatemala, it has the worst nutrition, malnutrition and stunting in the, in the Western Hemisphere. It's worse than Haiti uh, by the numbers, but you're there, it's green, it's verdant. They're growing you know, their, their fields in their fields. They've got the broccoli and the Brussels sprouts and the beans and the peas and everything that basically comes up to the markets here blowing around in the dirt and, in the, and, and, and at the base of, of all those nutritious vegetables and things are these plastic bags and the wrappings of the Tortrix, the Fritos, uh, the chips and everything else that the people who are farming are eating and throwing away while they go back and they, they uh, export things. And one woman that I was talking to, she had a baby on her back and she was uh, uh, in a, a field of peas. And so ask her, so uh, do you eat these peas yourself? She says, no, I don't, but I, I understand that other people do. <laughs> well, who are they? They're people that, there's a truck comes by. I said, what happens to them? She says, a truck comes by, we load the truck, and then, and then they disappear. I said, well, what do you eat? And she says, oh, we grow maize for ourselves to eat. And so their diets are maize-based and carbohydrate-based with the tortillas and the tamales, and the huge cultural shift and behavior change, precisely uh, what you're talking about. All right, it looks like we're time, it's time to take some questions from the audience. Great, we have about 15 minutes to take audience q and Is there anyone out there? Yes, young lady in the front row, please. And if you have a question for a specific presenter, please identify them, thank you. Hi, my name's Kate Collins. I'm a next generation delegate. I'm also a graduate student at Harvard and MIT. My question, I think, is for Salif, but there might be other effective advocates who wanted to jump in. Salif, one of the things I heard you hinting at was a national security rationale for developed countries to invest in agriculture and food security. I, I wonder how far you might draw that connection, especially in a country that's experienced conflict over the last five years. And I also wonder if any of the other panelists have experience as advocates making the national security case for food. Okay, let's take one more question from the audience, and we'll do one from Twitter. Yes, uh, the woman in the back row, please. Yeah, hi. Uh, I'm Zania Morin from Rutgers University. Um, my question for the panel is, what can we do at the university level to make uh, food systems and agriculture a part of every, everybody's education? Thank you. And one from Twitter comes from Kelly Knuckles, and she has a question for you, Jenny, which is, what role can both biotechnology and organic agriculture play in promoting health? Over you to again? you, Allison. I didn't hear the last part. Oh, sure. What role can both biotechnology and organic agriculture play in promoting health? Great. You want to go first, Jenny? Sure. I mean, uh, for us, you know, uh, why we decertified our organic uh, production was because a lot of what we were doing was um, already sort of organic practices, you know, no-till agriculture, cover crops, uh, IPM, crop rotation, those things. Um, but it came down to a balance of what, are you using something that's a pesticide that's natural, which is the organic, organic uh, material review institute list versus synthetic. Um, and for us as a farm, we've um, done less tillage and less um, pesticide applications through the use of biotechnology than we have in our conventional or our certified organic ground. So for that's why I say when we're talking about using synergies, we're trying to not fit a set of parameters or rules because the options to do a little bit of all of them work more advantageously. Um, and really, when our focus is on building soil, the farming system is irrelevant. We're doing the same soil building practices, whether we're farming 
conventionally with biotech or with organic. And so if the focus is on what the soil benefits are and how to improve the structure of the soil, the nutrients in the soil, um, the health of the soil, then regardless of how we are farming, it benefits the crop ultimately to be a more nutritious uh, product regardless of the farming system. Salif, do you want to take this international security question? Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, the, I think the national security, the linkages between food security and national security, I think that's pretty well, that's pretty well um, established. And yes, it's important for, you know, the major powers, you know, to see this, but I think it's even more important for uh, individual countries or, you know, if you take ECOWAS or the West African community, it's even more important for them to take agriculture extremely seriously. So you have the Maputo um, uh, Declaration uh, uh, pledge where countries supposed to spend at least 10% of their, of their budgets on agriculture, but that's, that is, I think it's wholly inadequate. But if we define you know, agriculture, you look at it from you know, seed all the way to, to, uh, to the plate. There's so many opportunities for governments to actually, or for entrepreneurs, both, especially in the diaspora, because that's something we should not lose sight of when we talk about financing of these endeavors. There's quite a bit of money sitting in the diaspora community that are now being sent for remittances to buy sometimes imported food. But if those remittances are instead invested you know, in, in smartly designed and smartly built farms, you can begin to address multiple um, you know, structural issues that tend to lead to instability and, and insecurity. But clearly, I think the, the national security argument, um, especially in a country like Mali, and I was talking, I can't remember what I was talking to earlier, just, just a really quick anecdote just to give you a sense of why this is critical to what's happening today, was that you can kind of trace back the conflict, the current conflict in Mali today to the 1972 drought when a lot of Tuareg men in, in, in northern Mali basically and families lost their entire uh, um, cattle, the troops. And these are essentially their bank accounts. So imagine waking up one day and your bank account is completely wiped. And what Qaddafi did at that time in the, in the early 70s was saw that opportunity and began recruiting thousands of these young men and taking them to Libya, training them, basically they became his mercenaries. He used them to fight in Chad. 30 years later, when Gaddafi fell, these are the guys that came back to northern Mali and completely destabilized the entire country and threatened the entire stability of the region. So if we, are, you know, if we take that as a, as, a, as a lesson, something as simple as a drought that happened 35 years ago, and what that did to, the, to communal relationships where all of a sudden you had pastoralists you know, arming themselves and going into conflict with, with farmers, it, it's, it's, it's complex, but I think it could also help us you know, really, really stress the importance of, of addressing food and nutrition you know, for, so that we can all live in a, in a peaceful world. Because at the end of the day, that's what we all want, is you know, to live in peace and live in harmony. Yeah. Alex, on that point on security, that both it's, it's hunger that can cause the conflict that you're talking about, but then obviously the re reverse, that insecurity, security issues and conflict and can also cause hunger and malnutrition and, and perpetuate it. And I'm finding that in three of the countries uh, that I met. So in Guatemala, uh, the, the, the several the couple decades long uh, civil war that was going on, really bad in, in the Western Highlands, that's where 60, 70 percent of the, of, of the children uh, are stunted. It, 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 it's remarkable. Um, in Uganda, in the north where I am, they had both the, the, the conflicts in the post-independence period, but then that's where the Kony uh, was rampaging for a couple of decades. And to be a mom in the thousand days was particularly perilous in that time because you were, they were fleeing up to the hills to sleep at night and then coming back down and they're thinking, into what kind of world am I bringing my child and what kind of life will they have? So the whole expectation of this, this, this aspiration of, of good education or doing the best thing for your child is kind of further down the list because you have the security concerns. And then in Chicago, it, 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 it's been, it, it's in, in, in some of the areas where the moms that I'm following have been particularly uh, violent uh, summers. And one of the moms, she was being asked, well, are, are, you, are you keeping up with your exercise regimen? And she says, I can't, I, my, my mom told me to stay in Side, not even do any walking on the street because she's seen men with guns on the, on the street. So it happens. It's not just a problem over there somewhere. It's, 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 these are issues that are also so critical here in the United States. 
David Fleming. I just want to quickly comment on the question on education. I think the thesis really of the meeting today is that when you're talking about nutrition and food, you're talking about a cross-sectoral issue that at minimum crosses the health sector, the food and agricultural sector, and that the best solutions are probably someplace in between. So as we're thinking about the education that we're providing to students, in either one of those sectors, we need to make sure that actually on the health side, um, they're getting a grounding in the realities of the food system and in the realities of agriculture and farming. And similarly, on the agricultural and food side, that the health issues that we've been talking today are part of the curriculum. Only by having knowledge on both sides can we expect that intersection to be fruitful. Shen. I mean, we, it's very interesting. Uh, looking through uh, our applications and, and uh, talking to entrepreneur to the question of university that you know when you look at the iconic companies created in the last few decades right and their university dropouts I mean so so students are facing especially students uh, late 20s thinking of uh, getting a, 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 a professional degree I mean when you look when, when, when you look at uh, Bill Gates and, and, and jobs and Allison uh, that's our co-founder and Zuckerberg they're all dropouts right and and uh, they uh, it's 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 a it's a it's, it's a reality they, they think constantly. Right? So, so what, what is a modern university? I mean, that's a totally different conference, maybe 10 of them, but, you know, but, but it's, it's, it's asking universal questions, but also now, actually, it is a good time that, that an idea can quickly become so relevant and accessible to a large portion of global population. I'll give you a couple of examples of how we're working with universities, and this is very important. All my, all my partners, there are six of us, uh, have a particular interest in education, we all, almost all of us independently founded uh, uh, education uh, charities. Is that one example in, in northern Italy, the Bologna um, University's um, food entrepreneurship, where they actually uh, took our, at that time, 17 filters, now it's 19 filters, as part of the admission process, not only taking individual students, they can also take co founders. Into the into the program, so, so there is a, there is a, so I'm seeing two things. One is in, when it comes to food and health and and, and taste and, and and cultural traditions, uh, culinary tradition, there is there is an opportunity, and now is the time actually to be able to ask universal questions so that we can create a faster environment of connected thinking, and I think that's really. The, the, the problem that a uh, uh, lot of food practices and agricultural practices lost our way because of the connected thing, that's probably the reason why good policies we can all agree, but bad politics prevent it from being implemented. Right? So, so, so connected thinking and universal question on one side, but directly connecting to highly scalable practical uh, pract ideas. I, I would add though that it, it precedes the university level, at least in the US when you figure um, uh, how many kids take home economics these days. Um, it's not in the curriculum anymore. Neither of my high school kids have that option. Um, and so we're not surprised that kids can't make um, informed decisions on what foods are healthy when they have a 45-day course in health um, for their entire four-year high school career. So we really have cut off our nose to spite our face in the earlier uh, generations of, of American education for I discussion within the more. food system. I, I would love to see courses for my children to, um, about food and health. I mean, they're just not available. The food pyramid may, may be more confusing than helping. You know? I was gonna say that these, these ideas that, are, that, are, that seem so simple but are revolutionary uh, in, in India and Guatemala and Uganda are also so in this country when you talk to uh, high school girls um, that are perhaps in a thousand days or entering that, or, or other new moms, the, 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 the absence of nutritional education, even cooking uh, instructions is, uh, is, is appalling. And it's, it's the exact, for an, for an American to be observing all this and to see this in all these other countries and to see the same thing and the same education, the same lessons, the same charts and posters being shown also in the United States is, is really quite, quite something to think about. Mm -hmm. Let's take another question via Twitter, um, and that is that we have spoken a lot about meeting the nutritional needs of people in rural areas, but we know that the world, especially low and middle income countries, are rapidly urbanizing. So the question is, what types of ideas and innovations will we need to nourish cities in the decades to come? Do you want to start, David? 
Well, it's a huge, it's a huge issue, yeah. right? And I, I think that we can learn um, from the mistakes that have been made in places like right outside this door that have become urbanized and the kind of food that is available. The bottom line is, is that we need to be moving now, uh, working with entrepreneurs to make healthy food products available in urban settings at, at prices and in places that are affordable, particularly to poor moms and kids. Right now, um, um, in, in Cairo, for example, the food that is available to a mother, it's almost impossible to find something that isn't calorie dense, nutrient poor. Um, and so she is in a position where she has no choice. The opportunity is to get in, into that space with alternatives, optimally locally produced alternatives, and um, she will buy them if those are available. Salif? Yeah, the, the issue of urbanization I think is, is critical, and some of the statistics suggest, for example, Bamako is the fastest growing city uh, you know, in Africa, and if not, if not the world. Um, and with urbanization, I think there's two ways to look at it. It's our current cities gonna get bigger and just keep expanding and expanding and expanding, or are small towns today gonna to be the cities of tomorrow? And if it's the latter, I think we have an incredible opportunity, you know, if it's a town that's, you know, traditional agriculture zone, to begin designing those cities for like future growth plans by really building, and I think we talked, we mentioned this this morning, like, is it Shanghai that's looking at uh, building gardens around Vertical, the city to yes. provide uh, food for, uh, mm -hmm. uh, for, the, uh, for the people in the urban areas? And I think that's an interesting opportunity we have, uh, especially in the developing world, where most of the population growth is expected to occur to complete redesign how we uh, manage land. So when we're building a new apartment complex, should we build you know, a big high-rise apartment complex without having a very good idea where a lot of the food is gonna come from? So I think that's an interesting opportunity we have uh, when you know, thinking about urbanization. Johnny, Roger. You know, I look at Maryland, it's a perfect example. We've lost 1.5 million acres of farmland since 1960 in this state. Um, and so the pressures in agriculture are only going to, to worsen. Um, and so when we look at development and urban planning, I think that's a really critical part to preserve as much farmland. Not only, I mean, the best means of farm, pr farm preservation is a profitable farm, because if the farmer is making money, and paying his bills, he's not going to sell the farm to a developer. Um, but at the same time, our in, our town and urban planning needs to be um, improved so that you're preserving as much productive soil in the land in the rural areas as possible. Roger? Yeah, I was gonna say, I think that Chicago was the first city to be mapped for food deserts and some of the original uh, research uh, was going on there and the one that did that is now expanding to, to Washington and even rural Iowa uh, communities and looking at that. And I think it was, that was a real shock and a wake up call to Chicago and other urban areas about the food security that, the food insecurity that exists in, in um, the urban areas. And again, the moms that I'm talking about in terms of the distance that they have to go, you know, on a bus and carry the shopping bags back, um, you know, to travel, because otherwise it's, it's there's, there's plenty of food, but it's, it's, it's the fast food uh, kinds and, and, and the bigger grocery stores that are there might also be, uh, be more uh, expensive. So there's a lot of innovations going on on uh, uh, food markets and urban agriculture and the planning and the rooftops and all that going on in Chicago and in Milwaukee and, and, and a number of other uh, cities. So I think that's really, really encouraging. And the, the, the council, one of the groups, I think the, the emerging leaders, uh, a couple of years ago did, uh, did their report on urban agriculture and, and what needs to be, and they looked at cities uh, around the world. So I think there's some, some really uh, innovative, uh, enterprising things that are going on. Shen, urban agriculture? Well, Funding actually, I'll, I'll start with a slightly different angle. It's making, you know, food need to be more fun. I mean, you, you know, food should be fun and enjoyable and, and not just a source of energy and even worse, a, a, a feeding a crave for, so sugar, fat. I mean, so 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 urban, uh, urban dense, densely populated urban uh, uh, areas have an opportunity because of the culinary uh, renaissance, and I think because of that, because of sourcing. So so there's a very very many interesting uh, 
uh, uh, models uh, uh, centered on cooking, you know, uh, meal kits and, and all of that. And of course, not to mention, I mean, in New York, in Brooklyn, I mean, that's the center of the, that, that's the new black, right? the center of uh, uh, the, the, the food universe now, that uh, uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, young farmer millennials going into, going into farming. Those are, those are trends we're, we're, we're taking very serious interest in. So, so to that point, they, they, uh, aeroponic, hydroponic, I mean, it's not, it's not so much ideological say this is all have to be soil organic. I mean, science can help. It's, about, it's a matter of uh, restoring that balance of, 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 of nature and ultimately the culinary art and, and, and the act of cooking. So, so, so eating and cooking, uh, by extension, is not, it's not just, uh, uh, it's not just uh, feeding ourselves, nourishing. It's actually moral and political act today because of the state of the food industry. Terrific. Well, let's turn back to the audience. I believe there was a question over here. If you want to run the microphone over. Thanks. What a wonderful panel. I'm Julie Howard, independent consultant formerly with USAID's Bureau of Food Security. I think I have, I have a very simple question for Shen. Uh, so how do you decide if something is scalable, and how do you decide when something has been scaled? So is there a tipping point? You know, do you have a, a rough guidance uh, for projects in the agriculture sector? And I'm, I'm assuming you're investing also in projects in, in Africa, for example. So would your reference point for scaling, does that differ for the things that you're looking at in Africa versus your food desert in, in Brooklyn? Simple question, thank you. Yeah, that's definitely a simple question by the fact that is the answer is simple, I don't know. We don't, I mean, if we can describe what innovation is today, it's probably not a true innovation. Right? I mean, basically, we, we're, we're looking at the fact that uh, 50 years from now, the, the big food companies uh, don't exist today. So, uh, and, and, and the history provided the evidence in other industries and, and even, even the stock market, you look at the, 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 the changes and the speed of changes only picking up, right? So, so, so we're learning as much from our entrepreneurs as our mentor networks are, are, are teaching them. So it's, 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 a, it's a peculiar combination of uh, science and, 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 and art, but there are approaches, uh, one of which I mentioned already, is a general framing in terms of perspective. You know, where, where, where are we, are we uh, uh, leveraging nature? I mean, that's such a, such a cheap and abundant resources. Are we scaling up by really focusing on scaling out? And enabling uh, uh, the little guys. Those are type of approaches. And then there are business disruption approaches where you see the, in, in the founder quality in cultural trend where uh, innovations, and, and because visionary by definition are nuts, right? You're, you're seeing things that other people don't see. You're seeing things that's not there, right? So you want to, you want to be able to attract co-innovators and cross chasm to the, uh, to the early adapters and then to the uh, uh, early mainstream adapters. And there are, there are tried and true uh, ways and skills uh, you can try to do that, but ultimately we're really facing a, a fairly qualified but the big unknown. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have, but Secretary Vilsack is coming up next. But please join me in thanking Allison and this outstanding panel of presenters. Thank you.